it's a similar experience, but it's very personalized. It's very tailored to you. And so that makes us feel like we're the only ones because we look at someone else and they're not experiencing imposter syndrome in the same way that we are for the same reasons that we do. So we assume they just don't experience it. And that's not true. And and again, studies have shown, and and I know empirically that up to 70 or 80% of the population experiences imposter syndrome at some point in their career. And, uh, and, and like I said, it's for different reasons, but it's a very common shared experience that we have. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. Okay, major confession time. Just in case you're thinking I've always been calm, cool, and collected in my life, let me clear you of that misguided notion right now. As much success that I've had in my career, I know that there could have been more. There could have been more because something was always holding me back. Something was causing me to struggle, professionally, personally, and everywhere in between. It's something that I struggled with for decades. Decades. It was the voice in my head that told me, you're not good enough. You should have done more by now. You should be more successful now. You're here talking to these successful people. You shouldn't even be in the same room with them. Oh, hey, congrats on that promotion. Too bad you're going to fail miserably at this job. And there were even worse things this voice would say to me that I don't even want to share here. I mean, this voice would say things to me that I would never say to anyone else. And I struggled going back and forth between believing and disbelieving and even trying to battle this voice for decades. Decades. And I kept trying to figure out what I needed to do to overcome it. At the same time, it was causing so much friction in my family, in my job, and in my faith. At close to a breaking point, I let myself finally get access to counseling. And through some long-term counseling, I came to recognize that this voice was my inner critic. And my inner critic was a liar. Until then, I thought I was the only one who struggled with this. But it turns out, I wasn't alone. In talking with my counselor and talking with others, it turns out that others suffer from this too. Now, one thing that's comforting is that a lot of people suffer from it. A lot. Wait, wait, so maybe that's not comforting to know that so many people are struggling. What's comforting? It's comforting to know that I'm not alone. You should be comforted to know that you're not alone. In fact, According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, over 70% of people experience imposter syndrome and that inner critic voice at some point. So if you don't suffer from it, there's a high chance that your people do. And if you're like me, and you do suffer from it, or you experience it, then there are tools to help you overcome it, likely more quickly than I did. And that's why... I was so happy to talk with Chris Kelso this week. Chris is an executive coach and a speaker who's helped thousands of leaders turn their teams around. And he's the author of the book, Overcoming the Imposter, Silence Your Inner Critic and Lead with Confidence. Chris and I talk about something that most leaders and most high performers struggle with, that inner critic voice that downplays our own accomplishments and tells us we don't have what it takes, that tells us we shouldn't be where we are. And we talk about the strategies and the tools to silence that inner critic voice to be able to emerge as a more effective and more confident leader. 
The book provides the powerful tools needed to expose the imposter's methods and help you emerge as a more effective and confident leader. So here it is. Here's my interview with Chris Kelso. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Matt, I am so glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. And, you know, here we are both in Nashville, but here we are meeting virtually. (laughs) Of course, that's the way of the world these days, right? Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't, but man, it is so much simpler to get certain meetings done when you can just meet virtually. It does make it more efficient. And especially when you're trying to do something like this, record uh, some audio, you know, for us to both be in our quiet rooms is a lot easier than trying to do this uh, out and about somewhere. Absolutely. Well, first thing, congratulations. This is your first book that you launched, Overcoming the Imposter. So great job on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is uh, my first book and it was quite a process. I learned a ton uh, about, you know, producing a book and, uh, and I'm really, really happy with the result. I, I think it turned out well and I had a great team around me that helped to make that happen. Excellent. And it, it, you're, you're right. It does help to have a good team in place because no matter who you are, you can't do it alone. No, absolutely. In fact, the, the, one of the best things that I did um, was I hired a writing coach, someone who has a lot of experience, uh, has written multiple number one bestsellers and sold millions of books. And uh, he was able to really guide me through the process and help me clarify what I was trying to accomplish. And it would not be nearly as good a book as it is without uh, his involvement. So shout out to Matt Litton. He was fantastic. Oh, very cool. Yeah. No matter what you're working on, no matter what your skills are, you've got to have a coach to help guide you along the way. But Chris, so your background is in software, consulting, leadership coaching. What what brought you to write this book? What brought you to write Overcoming the Imposter? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of my own experiences along with the observations of the hundreds of entrepreneurs that I've worked with over the years. Um, you know, I founded my first company about 14 years ago, um, founded a second company uh, a little bit later down the road and have been, uh, as you said, I went from being very technology driven, a software developer uh, early in my career to uh, leadership and running organizations and hiring people that in many cases were more experienced than me, more educated than me. Um, and so I personally experienced imposter syndrome along that journey, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was and I didn't know what to call it. And I thought it was just me. I didn't, I didn't know that this was a thing that, uh, that people experience and that psychologists have identified and, and, and have, uh, some language to talk about. And so when I first learned about imposter syndrome, number one, it was a huge relief, um, just to understand it and, and what was going on and to realize that you know, it wasn't just me. And this is something that's very common to a lot of people that are doing the kind of things that I do. And then as I begin to speak about it, um, I would get such great reactions from people who had that same kind of experience of, oh, oh my goodness, I, I had no idea that I thought it was just me. I thought I was the only one. I, I, I didn't realize that these feelings, these doubts, this insecurity, and this voice in my head, that it has a name and that I can counteract it. And it's not real, that it's just a a mind game and a a psychological trap. So as I begin to see the relief in people, as I would explain it to them and share some of my story, uh, it became evident that there was a real need and a real uh, opportunity to help people this way. I'm a person that reads a lot of books and recommends a lot of books. uh, Some of my clients say that I'm constantly giving them reading assignments. And that's great. uh, and I, when, when someone has a problem and I've read something that is helpful, I try to, you know, point them in that direction. But I searched and I couldn't find a book that I felt like uh, really encompassed what I had learned about imposter syndrome. And so it, it eventually became a compulsion. I felt like this book needed to exist and it didn't. So I had to write it. And, uh, and so during 2020, that's what I did. Yeah. And to your point, you know, I've, I've looked around and, and I've seen a good handful of books that will touch on imposter syndrome. But a lot of times it appears to be that, that those books are written for specific audience. And a lot of times it's either for 
a female leader audience or even more of like a, a young person's audience? Like, you know, don't feel bad for being young and, and succeeding and don't have imposter syndrome because you're young or females have imposter syndrome as they're moving up in their career or as they're moving up in their leadership chain. So I haven't seen any books that really touched on it from your perspective or from the male perspective. So you're right. I think it's really needed. Yeah, there, there's a there's been a misconception about imposter syndrome that it is primarily a female problem or that it only affects uh, minorities or you know certain people in certain circumstances. And even the early research that was done on imposter syndrome going back to the 70s uh, was primarily focused on women in the workplace, women kind of climbing the ladder in corporate America and feeling like they didn't measure up or that they were a fraud and. Um, So there's sort of a misunderstanding that it primarily affects women, but multiple studies have shown that it affects men and women equally. It crosses uh, cultural and ethnic barriers and boundaries that it, that it's not a woman problem or a minority problem. It's just, it's a human problem. Now that said, women do tend to be more honest about it. They tend to be willing to talk about it a little more. And so that also feeds that perception that it mostly is affects women, but um, men experience it just as much. We just don't talk about it quite as openly. And so there again, I felt compelled. I felt like there was a need for uh, someone like me, a white male to say, Hey, this is a challenge that I've faced that my peers have faced that I've observed in a a, a lot of different circumstances. And, uh, and here's some examples of those stories that are not just from minorities. And I think it's good to say that we're not discounting the fact that minorities, marginalized communities, females experience imposter syndrome. It's that Absolutely. it affects everybody equally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it affects us all equally, but for different reasons. So, you know, mm. if if women experience imposter syndrome because they're the only woman and they don't have someone else like them or, a, you know, someone who's a minority in a situation and, you know, they're the only African-American or they're, they're the only uh, a person of, of color of or of their nationality or descent, that, that might be a reason that that voice of doubt is speaking to them and telling them that they don't measure up or they can't do it. And, and that's going to be a different reason than what I will experience. So we, we experience imposter syndrome for different reasons. Um, and I really cover this in the first couple of chapters in the book, the fact that it's a similar experience, but it's very personalized. It's very tailored to you. And so that makes us feel like we're the only ones because we look at someone else and they're not experiencing imposter syndrome in the same way that we are for the same reasons that we do. So we assume they just don't experience it. And that's not true. And, and again, studies have shown, and, and I know empirically that up to 70 or 80% of the population experiences imposter syndrome at some point in their career. And, uh, and, and like I said, it's for different reasons, but it's a very common shared experience that we have. Oh, wow. My assumption around imposter syndrome was that it's essentially the same for everyone, that uh, that everyone's imposter is pretty close to the same. And most people basically hear the same kind of statements from their imposter. But what you're saying is that research shows that that's not the case. It isn't the case. And in fact, I have talked with people who have imposter syndrome for exactly the opposite reasons as one another. So I, I give you an example. Yeah. Um, one part of one of my struggles personally was that I never went to college. I don't have a college degree. I never went to school. There's a whole backstory of my career and the twisty windy road that got me to where I am. But early in my entrepreneurial journey, especially, I felt like not having that business school experience was going to hold me back. And I always feared that I was going to be found out because I didn't have that education. But I've talked to other people who have degrees and advanced degrees, and they feel like they've only gotten where they are because of their degree, not because of their actual merit. Like that, that their degree opened doors for them that they actually don't fit in or don't deserve or can't fulfill. They can't measure up to what their you know piece of paper certificate says they should be. So they get into jobs and then feel like they're in over their head and they think, well, 
you know, maybe that degree has got me somewhere that, that I can't actually fit. I can't actually fulfill this role. Um, I've also talked to people that think that, you know, they have, they have imposter syndrome because they're not well connected. They don't come from a, a wealthy family or they don't, you know, have all these powerful relationships in their industry. And so they feel like sort of an outsider. And then on the other hand, I've talked to people who feel like they've gotten by on connections and relationships, and they've gotten by maybe on their family name or the relationships of their parents or, or some background has, has sort of been a crutch for them. And so people who have come from very opposite circumstances can both look at the other and say, I wish I had what you had. And if I had what you have, then I would be qualified, then I would be able to make it. And so here again, it's the same experience for very different and even opposite reasons. And we have to recognize that those comparisons that we do and, and looking at other people and, and trying to measure up to someone else's accomplishments or credentials, is just, uh, it's a trap. It's, it's what I call the comparison trap. And it's what feeds that voice that tells us we're not enough and we're not qualified. Oh, wow. Okay. So recognizing that it's not the same for everybody. In fact, it seems like people can have imposter syndrome for a wide variety of reasons with a wide variety of imposter voices, imposter statements, but yeah. it comes down to more of a general definition is in, in that you're not enough. You shouldn't be here. Yes. Yeah. And maybe for any listeners that are listening going, okay, what exactly is imposter syndrome? I'll define it really quickly. Um, it's it, it, people who struggle with imposter syndrome have this persistent fear that they're not what everyone seems to think they are. And, and what they tend to do is overvalue other people's success and accomplishments and undervalue or even doubt the reality of their own success. And what happens often in this comparison trap is, you know, I look at Matt Lyles and I say, well, man, Matt is just such a successful guy and he's got this podcast and he's, you know, doing all this great work and, and his success is because he's smart and he's savvy and he seems to have a plan and execute it well. And he, he knows all the right moves to make and, and, uh, and he's probably got a college degree and, and, you know, whereas my success as an entrepreneur and as a coach has it sure has involved a lot of luck and timing and just happening to know the right people. Or, you know, if I hadn't landed that one big client, I may not have made it back in those early days. Or, you know, if this hadn't happened to me, um, who knows where I would be. And boy, I've sure made a lot of mistakes along the way and somehow managed to figure out a way around it. But any one of those mistakes could have really sunk me. And, and so what happens is when you have imposter syndrome, you have this persistent nagging fear that sooner or later, someone or everyone is going to figure out that you really don't know what you're doing, that, that you're just making it up as you go or, or figuring it out along the way. And that, that you're not really qualified or you're not really who people think you are. And that if that happens, you're going to be exposed as a fraud and you're going to lose you know, whatever credibility or responsibility or opportunities you have, and it's all going to come crumbling down around you. And not everyone feels it that strongly and acutely as, as you know, that it's right imminent any moment, but many, many people walk around worrying that maybe I don't measure up to what people think that I am and I'm at risk. And so we end up managing our image and trying to protect our reputation and trying to, to, you know, buffer what people know and what they hear and, and, and what they believe about us. And we expend a lot of energy just trying to protect something that really isn't nearly as at risk as we think it is. Oh, yeah. And then on the flip side of that, you know, you were talking about looking at Matt Lyles and thinking how successful he is. And I would say that Matt Lyles would say, you have no idea what goes on behind the scenes in my business. <laughs> That's exactly right. Because all of our businesses and all of our work and, and careers, and, and they all have cracks under the surface. They all have flaws. They all have struggles. None of us is 100% successful at every single thing we attempt all the time. In fact, most successes are built on a mountain of failures. 
um, because failure is how you learn and experimenting and trying and, and learning and adapting is how success is made, but you don't see all of those failures. So in, in one of the chapters, in chapter seven, I lay out a, a bunch of examples of famous people that you've heard and know about from you know sports figures like Babe Ruth and Michael Jordan to industry uh, titans like uh, uh, Hershey um, and uh, and you know going back to Thomas Edison and to and people that have built big, big businesses and politicians like Abraham Lincoln and and I actually lay out some of the failures that they experienced many of the failures they experienced on their road to success and how they viewed failure differently than some of us do. And they just saw it as part of the process, as part of the uh, uh, the progression of getting success, of mastering something. And so um, you have to reevaluate and, and reorient yourself, how you feel about failure and how you view failure in order to be able to embrace it and learn from it and build your success on that failure. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think enough people really understand that. And I don't think enough people even put that as part of the story of some of these successful people. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about like some of the athletes uh, that you write about in your book. And yeah, it, it, and I've, I've been studying a lot of that lately around the failures of athletes and the failures of entrepreneurs and business leaders or in the, in the failures of even famous musicians. You know, and um, what, what, what's interesting, if you look at the stats in uh, professional basketball, NBA basketball, some of the top 10 players of the, the top 10 most missed shots in their career, number one is Kobe Bryant. He's missed yeah. or he, he, he missed over 12,000 shots in his career. And yeah. you, you, you mentioned Michael Jordan, too. He's got his quote saying that he's missed 9,000 shots. Actually, I think he missed closer to like 11,000 shots, according to the stats. Yeah. And we tend to forget about that. Yes. And, and Babe Ruth, who was considered one of the greatest baseball players of all times, his, his nickname that people remember was the Sultan of SWAT. But he also had a nickname that people have forgotten. And that was the king of strikeouts. That's right. And he actually held the strikeout record for 30 years, the major league baseball strikeout record for 30 years. And it, and then his record was eventually beaten by a guy named Mickey Mantle. Yeah. Yeah. So these guys struck out because they took big risks, but they were also successful because they took big risks. And had they been afraid of strikeouts. In fact, Babe Ruth was quoted as say, saying, never let the fear of striking out keep you from success, from attempting something, from, from trying. Because if you fear striking out, if you fear failure, that fear is going to hold you back from the success that you seek and you desire because failure is part of the process. It's, it's the learning process. It is. It, it, it has to be part of the process. And if not, then there is no process and you don't grow. And Chris, you know, you, you know me, you know, I'm a big music fan. I love all kinds of music, musicians and all the stories behind them. And this week I got to go see Joan Jett and the Blackhearts at the Ryman Auditorium. I love nice. that show. But what is so interesting that people don't talk enough about, about her background. And we think of like, well, where would rock and roll music be today without Joan Jett? Where would a lot of today's female artist be without Joan Jett. But did you know that yeah. she was rejected by 23 different record labels? 23 record labels rejected her and said, no, no one wants to hear a female rock star. No one wants to see yeah. a female playing guitar. And she went through all of those rejections and then decided, I still have to do this. So she created her own label and released her music through her own label. Had she not done that, we would have never gotten that music. Yeah. Yeah. Just an, another example of someone persevering and not accepting failure as final. Failure is not final and failure is not fatal until you accept it as the last word. So you just got to keep moving on. There you go. Failure is not final. Did you know that in addition to my podcast and my articles, I speak to audiences all over to help them simplify their customer experience and simplify their employee experience. 
I've spent the last few years leading a crusade of simplicity across the globe. If you want a winning brand, you have to provide a simple experience to your customers and to your team members. Whether it's a live event or a virtual event, I'd love to partner with you and teach your audience how to do just that. With over a decade in marketing, I know how to hook and captivate an audience. And as a speaker, I know how to connect with that audience. Along with my lessons, I use stories and humor to keep everyone engaged and inspired. Then they leave with the knowledge and next steps to transform their business. As an event planner, you're managing lots of details to give your audience the most memorable event. The last thing you need is a speaker who will make your event memorable for all the wrong reasons. Not only will I leave your audience energized and inspired, I'll make it easy for your team to work with me. Hey, if I've built my brand around simplicity, then you know I'm going to make it simple for you. When you visit mattliles.com slash speaking, you'll find everything you need to know, including details on my topics, promotional materials, and most importantly, a link to connect with my team so we can book your event. So visit mattliles.com slash speaking. I can't wait to help your audience brand out from the crowd. Chris, I got to ask you, so you've seen imposter syndrome, you've, you've experienced previously, you've coached a lot of people through imposter syndrome, but you know, did you experience imposter syndrome while writing this book? Yes, actually, uh, I, I wrote in the book about a little bit about that experience as I got toward the end, because um, one of the other misconceptions about imposter syndrome is that it's something that you just, uh, you, you learn about it, and then you figure out how to get over it, and then you're done. You, you counteract it, and it goes away. And that's unfortunately just not how it happens. It doesn't, it doesn't get mastered in one big climactic victory, you know, where you strike the death blow or you cross the finish line. Understanding and managing imposter syndrome is, is a journey and it becomes a discipline. Uh, and it does get easier over time, uh, definitely, especially as you learn to recognize what's going on. But um, where imposter syndrome tends to creep up again is when you're trying something new when you're doing something that you've never done before, or you're getting outside of your comfort zone. And so for people that are comfortable with sort of taking a job and punching a clock and, and doing the same thing day in and day out, and they're just trying to get to the weekend and live their life, they're, they're not likely to experience much, much imposter syndrome. And, and, and they're going to you know get into a groove and just feel very comfortable and stay in that comfort zone. But Matt, for people like you and me who are interested in pushing the boundaries, in stretching ourselves, in getting better, in doing more, we're going to continually encounter moments where we feel like we're in over our head. In fact, this is one of the reasons that I think imposter syndrome affects entrepreneurs and innovators probably more than any other group is because entrepreneurs tend to find themselves in over their head, outside their comfort zone. They're trying and, and experimenting and attempting things that have never been done before more than anyone else. And that, that puts us on a crash course with uncertainty. And along with that uncertainty can come a little bit of self-doubt and a little bit of wonder of, have I gotten too far out over my skis? Have I, have I you know, finally done more than I can, try to bite off more than I can chew? And so, as, as we talked about at the beginning, this is my first book. I'd never written one before. I've written some short form uh, stuff, articles and things like that before, but attempting to write a book was was kind of daunting. And I, uh, I wasn't sure I could write a book that would be good enough that I would want my name on the cover. And, and so, like I said, I hired a great writing coach who helped me a ton. Um, but even during that process, there were moments when I thought, what am I doing? Why am I trying to write this? And and then the fact that I had a little bit of imposter syndrome about writing a book made me feel unqualified to write a book about imposter syndrome. So it became this wow. self-reinforcing problem. Um, but I had to really use some of the same techniques and, and the same evidence that I lay out in the book on myself. I had to, to take my own medicine and, uh, and reframe how I was thinking about this learning process of writing a book and figuring it out and making some mistakes. And, and boy, I'm so glad that I did because uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled with the way it turned out. And I'm 
really, really proud of the fact that that I did it, that I've that I've published a book. And I, I now that I've done it, I probably will do more and it'll it'll come a little easier the next time around. But uh it's 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 not something that you're gonna do away with forever unless you decide to just get comfortable and quit growing and quit pushing yourself. But as long as you're pushing and growing and stretching, you're going to potentially encounter some self-doubt. And so you've got to be prepared for that and recognize it when it comes. And that's good to understand because it's those that are growing are the ones that are going to experience it. If you're not yes. growing, you're likely not going to experience it. But then also, if you're not growing, then that's where you may find yourself uh, stuck in a rut. Yeah. But, but when you do get out of your comfort zone, when you are doing something new, you talk about recognizing imposter syndrome. How do you recognize it? What are the signs of it so that you can say, oh, that's what this is, and here's how I get over it? So the book is called Overcoming the Imposter, and I chose to name the voice in my head, that, that voice of doubt, that inner critic that wants to tell me, Chris, you, you can't do this. You're in over your head. You don't know what you're doing. You're, you're at risk. I chose to name that voice the imposter, not because it's trying to convince me that I'm an imposter, which it is, but really to remind me that that voice isn't real. There's no one there. It's not a real person. And it's not the voice of reason. It's not sound judgment. It's doubt and insecurity trying to creep in and dominate my thinking. And so I call that voice out. I call it the imposter. And I've learned to recognize that when I get in a situation, for instance, where I'm, I'm among some people that intimidate me, perhaps they're people I respect, people I admire, maybe a business person who's achieved a lot more than I have, or uh, a public speaker or a coach who is much more successful than me, uh, someone that's further down the road. I, I could be intimidated by that person. And I could hear that voice saying, you don't deserve to be here. You have nothing to offer in this group of people. But I've learned to recognize that feeling as actually a sign that there's a great opportunity ahead. When you feel like you're in over your head or you're surrounded by people that intimidate you, there's so much to learn there. There's so much to be gained from leaning into those experiences rather than pulling out of them. And so I've learned to see imposter syndrome and, and to recognize that voice as a sign of opportunity. And so when I'm feeling in over my head, I say, well, all right, I'm going to start, I'm going to raise my antenna and look for what's my learning opportunity here. What can I get out of the situation rather than running back to my comfort zone? Um, similarly, the, the, the times that I have felt most insecure in my career uh, have turned out to be the most pivotal moments of my career. It's the times when something great was happening, when I was on the verge of some new accomplishment or discovery or learning, um, but it felt very uncomfortable because I was so far out of my comfort zone. And so, you know, part of the process of writing a book like this is I went back and looked at my career and my life and was sort of cataloging my experiences. And I really had this aha moment that the times I've experienced imposter syndrome the most, the times that that voice was the loudest, that was when the greatest work was happening and the, the pivotal moments in my career were going on. And I had a choice in those moments to either run away and try to get comfortable again, or to lean into that discomfort and to get everything I could out of that situation. And I didn't always do the right thing, but I'm so glad that in many of those circumstances, I was able to push through the discomfort and, and learn or accomplish a lot in those uncomfortable situations. I love that. I really like how you renamed that voice as the one that's truly the imposter and recognizing too that that when that voice shows up, that there's likely a big opportunity ahead. And a few years ago, I started doing the same thing with fear. Whenever fear yeah. would show up around something, I started looking at it as like an old friend. Oh, you're here? Hey, that's mm. awesome. That means something really big is just around the corner. All right. Thanks. Yeah. See you later. Bye-bye. Um, yes. So maybe the same thing with that imposter. When the imposter shows up, that means, oh, great. There's a good opportunity around. Yes, it absolutely does. It's a, it's a, it's a guidepost now for me. 
And, and so I'm, I'm not trying to get rid of that voice. I'm trying to think about it differently and to listen for it and recognize it as a positive sign uh, and actually lean in when I hear it. So I'm curious, what are some of the environments or what are some of the triggers that can amplify someone's imposter voice, someone's imposter syndrome? So as, I, as we talked about before, it's unique for everyone. And so you may not experience imposter syndrome in the same circumstances that I do, because it's going to be related to your background and your history and the, and the areas of your life or your work where you feel less comfortable, less secure, and, and maybe feel like you don't have as firm a foundation. Um, I used to have this, this persistent fear. I would, I would literally imagine that one day I'd be sitting in a conference room or, or a meeting of some kind with a bunch of educated business people, uh, you know, all MBAs, and someone would bring up a principle or a model that was discussed on the very first day of business school, which of course I didn't attend. Right. And, and so they'd say something like, well, of course we can't do that because of the Thompson principle. Chris, you know the Thompson principle, right? And then the entire room would turn and look at me, waiting for me to give some commentary on the Thompson principle. <laughs> and and so, you know, sweat would start to form on the back of my neck and I would start to stammer around trying to say something intelligent until finally it became clear to everyone that I had no idea what the Thompson principle was. And then at that point, some men in black suits and dark sunglasses would come in and say, excuse me, sir, you need to come with us. And, you know, I'd be ostracized from the community. But and of course, that never happened. But that's an example of where my lack of an education that I thought was so necessary would cause me to fear certain situations, certain conversations, certain types of crowds. But for, for you, Matt, it may be a totally different experience. It may yeah. not be in a business circle. It might be, you know, when you're with artists or you're with someone that's very creative, or uh, maybe perhaps it's in uh, some group that is uh, more athletic or they're public speakers or, you know, they've, they've got some accomplishment that you feel like you lack and you, you suddenly have a fear of, I hope no one figures out that I'm the only one in the room that doesn't measure up. And, and what I've learned over the years is that often when you have that feeling of, I, I'm the only one here and I hope no one figures out, Often there's several people, and sometimes even the majority of the room, feeling that same way, thinking I'm the only one, and I hope no one figures it out. And and so in some circumstances, I'll just call it out. I'll just say, hey, you know, here's here's what I here's my insecurity, here's my fear, here's my weakness. And not only does it help me, because when other people say, Oh, me too, I was feeling that same way. I'm so glad you said that it helps relieve some of that pressure for me, but it also offers a lifeline to them that, hey, we can let our guard down. We can talk about what we have and don't have. I don't have a business degree. This other person doesn't have you know, business experience that I might have. He has a degree, but he doesn't have the experience that I do of founding two companies and, and doing these things. So let's quit trying to pretend that we're all the, the, the best of everything. And let's just talk about how we can help one another. And so by breaking down some of those barriers, we can um, help ourselves and help one another by opening up and getting a little bit vulnerable. Uh, but I think I, I detracted or I, I sidetracked from your question, which is, you know, where, where are people going to experience it? And it's, it's really different for everyone because it depends on what types of things your imposter is telling you and what kind of situations you're comfortable with versus the situations where you feel like you're really outside your wheelhouse. And as I said, the, that's where the magic happens, outside your comfort zone. So you've got to yeah. recognize it and you've got to go there even when it's uncomfortable. Oh yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. And I'm a big fan of self-awareness and personal assessments, self-assessments. And so I understand my tendencies, you know, like on, on the Myers-Briggs scale, I'm in ENFP. So when I'm mm. in a group setting, when I'm around people, I am in the zone and I'm loving it. So, yeah. but I will, so, so if, if I'm with people in person and they're talking about some of their 
highlights and milestones, that doesn't seem to affect me. But I will say that recognizing myself, and it's something that I've tried to work on, is I know one of my biggest triggers is seeing others' milestones in social media. If I yes. happen to just be, you know, stuck in a moment where I'm mindlessly scrolling and I see other, you know, speakers saying that they got this gig or that they've spoken at this event with, you know, this size crowd, like I'll think, man, that's not me. I can't yeah. get that. So that like, yeah. that, that's, I, that's me. That's my trigger. And so maybe to your point, it's being able to recognize as an individual, what are those specific environments? What are those specific triggers? Yeah. And social media has definitely exacerbated this problem that I call the comparison trap. Um, And anytime you're comparing yourself to someone else, almost a hundred percent of the time, you're comparing the reality of your life against a very polished and filtered version of their life. You just don't know everything that's going on in their life and business. And so often on social media, what you're getting is a highlight reel. In fact, one time I went back and looked at my Facebook feed, um, looked over several years of my own, you know, highlights on social media. And I thought, wow, I'd like to live that life. That's pretty great. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. Look at all the stuff that guy's done. And and I, and I I had this realization that even my own social media is just the highlight reel of my life. And it doesn't reflect the struggles and the challenges and the, and even just the mundane of the everyday, you know, I don't, I don't get an amazing speaking gig every day. I don't go on an awesome trip to some other country every month, but that's the kind of stuff that gets posted online. And so it can feel like, and, and when you sort of aggregate everyone's highlights, it feels like the whole world is passing you by and they're, they're all getting ahead of you. They're all moving faster than you are. So you, you just have to recognize, and that, that doesn't mean you need to get off social media and you need to stay away from that stuff. You just have to have a right perspective. Okay, I'm getting the highlight reel. That's great. I'll celebrate with those people. I'll be glad for them. And then I'm going to get back to reality because that's what they're doing at the same time. While you're looking at their highlight reel, they're off dealing with their challenges and their struggles. And, and so you've got to recognize that those things are a part of all of our stories, the good and the bad. And, uh, and, and not allow yourself to fall into that comparison trap where you're comparing the reality of your life against a highlight reel of someone else's life. Yeah. I'm trying to remember like who originated this quote. I've heard it from a number of people, you know, including say John Acuff, but it's, we're comparing our behind the scenes to somebody else's highlight reel. Yes. So don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've sometimes said we're comparing what we look like rolling out of bed to what someone else looks like walking out their front door. It's, it's a completely different experience. Um, you know, looking at the the person that they have m- made for you to see versus the reality of what's underneath. All right. So we've covered imposter syndrome. We've covered a lot of how it can come in, how to recognize it. But what can somebody do? to overcome it? What can somebody do to silence that inner critic voice? What's the antidote? So the interesting thing about imposter syndrome is that it causes you to fear vulnerability. It causes you to fear opening up and being honest about who you are, about what you have and haven't done, about where your success begins and ends and your experience lies. And and yet, the antidote for imposter syndrome is vulnerability. It's opening up and letting people see you for who and what you really are because you take away the weapons of the imposter. There, there's two primary weapons of the imposter, and we've touched on both of them a little bit, they're, and they're fear-based. One is the fear of failure. The voice will tell you, if you try that, you're not going to succeed, you're going to fail, and that's going to that's that failure is going to be fatal. And when you reframe failure as learning and you embrace failure as part of the process, you take away that weapon. You take away that part of the voice of saying, avoid failure, be afraid of failure. And, and there's no more ammunition there. The second one is the fear of vulnerability. As I mentioned, when we define imposter syndrome, it's the fear that people are going to figure out who and what you really are. Well, the way to rid yourself of that fear is to just be authentic 
about who and what you really are. And when you begin to open up about, you know, not just your highlight reel, but also the failures and struggles and learning and, and trials and challenges and things that you've dealt with to get to where you are, and even the things you're dealing with now, you take away that ammunition, that weapon of the imposter to say, if people figure out who you are, they're going to reject you. Because what happens is when you open up, when you get vulnerable, when you get authentic, we think people are going to reject us. We think people are going to shame us, but nine times out of 10, the opposite happens. People respect us. People actually gravitate towards us uh, and I've shared, I share some stories in the book about when I've opened up with other entrepreneurs and other people, and suddenly it freed up conversations and it created an, and it opened doors and created trust and powerful discussion that actually changed things rather than staying at a superficial, let's compare our stats and, and try to outdo one another level. And so the, the two fears of imposter syndrome is the fear of failure and the fear of vulnerability. And if you embrace failure as learning and just open up and be vulnerable, you, you strip away those weapons and the imposter has no power. Early on, when I would think about imposter syndrome, my immediate assumption was that simply being around others or being a part of community would help overcome imposter syndrome. But then in your book, you you talk about simply being part of a community doesn't help. You've got to have that vulnerability along with the community that helps make so much more sense. Yeah. Your community can actually work against you in terms of imposter syndrome. If there's no vulnerability there, if everybody's presenting the very best version of themselves, everybody is talking about their highlight reel. Everybody's in sales mode. Everybody's got a mask on then it's going to be like your social media experience. You're going to feel like everyone's winning and I'm not, and that makes me inferior. So community, as important as it is, it can actually hurt you if there's not a vulnerability there. If you're not in groups of people and connected in relationships where vulnerability is not only allowed, but it's celebrated and rewarded and encouraged, um, when there's vulnerability there, your community is going to work for you. It's going to starve that imposter rather than feed it. That really helps out. And I like how you talk about being able to encourage and reward vulnerability. And so I, th I think of leaders, you know, sometimes like there, there are leaders who have figured out how to overcome their imposter or have figured out how to manage through that. But as leaders, we also may have some of our own people that report to us who are struggling with imposter syndrome. Yeah. So how can leaders help their own people to overcome imposter syndrome? Well, first of all, anytime I talk to a leader who says, oh, that's not an issue in our organization and people don't have imposter syndrome, I'm, I'm not going to say 100% of the time because I don't know every circumstance, but 99% of the time, it means that they're oblivious to it. And imposter syndrome is absolutely affecting people in their organization. Because what that tells me, if they say, if 70% of the population experiences it, and it's more prevalent among high achievers, which is statistically proven, then if you don't have any of this going on in your organization, either you have only the very lowest, you know, 10, 20, 30% of uh, employees in your organization, or you're oblivious, or you have your head in the sand, or you're in denial. And, and what that often means is that there's not a culture where vulnerability is allowed, where people feel safe saying, hey, I, I think I'm in over my head here. Hey, I, I, I've got this assignment and I'm not really sure that I'm up to it and I need some help. Hey, I, I've just been promoted and I may need some coaching. I may need some, some guidance because uh, I, this job may be a little big for where I'm at right now. I need to grow into it a little bit. And so if you don't have people in your organization that feel comfortable saying those kinds of things, then I would encourage you to really take a hard look at your culture and make sure you're not inadvertently, sometimes it's accidental, but make sure you're not inadvertently um, creating an environment where vulnerability and, and authenticity and admitting a weakness is punished, is, is frowned upon, is shamed, where people uh, feel like they can't express those kinds of concerns. Um, because it, it absolutely exists, even among confident, 
innovative, uh, ambitious, driven people, there's going to be some experience of fear and insecurity and worry. And you've got to be you've got to build a culture where it's okay to talk about those things and you actually will eradicate it by opening up and letting people express it and then helping them deal with it rather than trying to be in denial and suppress it and say that has no place here. You're, you're, you're actually just going to feed it if you say things like that. Right, right. Yeah. I don't have the research to back it up, but my assumption is, is that when you, go in that opposite route, when you don't allow vulnerability, then I would think that imposter syndrome grows even more inside individuals. Yes, that that is the case. Because when you say that vulnerability is not allowed, and when you say that, you know, people can't express a concern about a shortcoming or a weakness, or they, you know, that everybody's got to measure up and everybody's got to be confident all the time, then when people do experience that self-doubt, they feel like I, I don't fit here. I don't measure up. I can't make it. And that just feeds that problem of imposter syndrome, of feeling like a fraud. And, and then, but they feel compelled to cover it up, to try to put a mask on, to try to overcompensate. And really what you're doing is you're causing them to spend a lot of energy managing their image, compensating for their perceived weaknesses and, and, and trying to live up to something rather than just focusing on doing good work. Um, so you can actually degrade the performance of your organization. You can make it a lot less efficient when you create this artificial requirement for everyone to look and sound like they've got it all together. Yeah. Wow. All right, Chris, last question for you. If you were to create a five song soundtrack, for overcoming the imposter, what songs would you include? Wow. You know, I would probably start with uh, Voices by Switchfoot. Great song. Um, Message in a Bottle by The Police. Oh, yes. Wow. Uh, Change Your Mind by Sister Hazel. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I would probably go with Alive by Need to Breathe. Great recent tune. And then go back to a you know, a classic like either Where the Streets Have No Name by U2 or maybe even You Could Call Me Al by Paul Simon, which is, you know, just a fun song, but also says a lot about identity and reframing. Oh, it does. Yeah. No, that that's that's fantastic. And, you know, b- both of those two completely different songs. But yeah, just You Can Call Me Al, just being able to kind of get down to that one-on-one relationship level. But then Where the Streets Have No Name, I mean, the both the lyrics, but also like just the music itself is just so inspirational and like helps yes. drive you to want to be bigger and better. It really does. I love the way that song builds and builds and and you know, just there's a, there's a subtle energy there that is, uh, that gives a lot of enthusiasm. I think it does. Wow. Love that. Love that mix. Love that soundtrack. Thank you, Chris. We've learned a lot from you, but I know there's so much more that people can learn. Where can people go to learn more from you? Yeah, there's two uh, places online. Uh, my website is chriskelso.com and Chris starts with a K K R I S K E L S O. Uh, and the website about the book specifically is overcomingtheimposter.com. Uh, but you can read about me and my work on either one of those sites. I'm also fairly active on social media, especially LinkedIn, but also Facebook and a little bit on Instagram, Twitter, places like that. So as long as you remember, I'm Chris with a K, I'm pretty easy to find. And uh, I love interacting, engaging with people. Um, I work on a number of levels as a one-on-one coach and with leadership teams and also uh, speaking to large audiences and uh, at conferences and events like that. So uh, I connect with people at uh, a number of levels and uh, would love to hear from your audience. Excellent. Lots of ways for people to interact and learn from you. And Chris, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot from the book and I've learned even more just from our conversation today. So like I, I feel inspired. I feel better you know, to be able to go back out there today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're well, welcome, Matt. And I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. It's been really fun having this conversation. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Chris Kelso. So go ahead, check out his book, Overcoming the Imposter. 
And if you want to take your reading experience to the next level, you can join Chris's Overcoming the Imposter peer group. You'll be able to work with Chris directly, along with a dozen other professional leaders, to learn how to silence your inner critic and lead with confidence. You can find it all at overcomingtheimposter.com. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead, hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it a lot simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring John Meese. John is the CEO of Cowork, Inc., He's the previous dean of Platform University, he's the host of the Thrive School podcast, and he's the number one best-selling author of Survive and Thrive, How to Build a Profitable Business in Any Economy, including this one. John and I talk about how the global pandemic affected, and continues to affect, our economy and affects small business owners. And we discuss the key plan that business owners can use for building or rebuilding a business with legs that will last for the long haul, even in the next economy impacting event. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get John's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then... Keep it simple.